Uh, our ministry is called Saved by Truth International Ministry now. <laughs> we are now international. It used to just be here domestically, but now we are an international ministry uh, that is being led by God and uh, to bring people to Him. And so uh, our little scripture there is John 17, 17, Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. And, uh, you know, God put that scripture on our wife's heart years ago, and it's been really... Uh, impacting for us because that's what we do. We try to teach the truth to the people that want to learn it. Uh, we've learned that most don't and very few do. And so it's really exciting for us to um, have our ministry that we can really get together as a body and, and really teach this word around the world. And so I want to show you a little bit about you know what God's been doing around the world um, as a ministry because um, this is the scripture Matthew 16, 19. God put it on my heart yesterday, which is I will give you the keys of the kingdom. It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And, uh, you know, we're going to go through that message today. That's the title of the message. And so I just wanted to show you what God's been binding on earth so far in these last 30 days. Because in the last 30 days, you know, God's changed the messages again to really have an outreach and have a heart to really want to serve the, the people of God that really love him. And here in the United States, it's been a really interesting situation because I, I talk to a lot of people on Facebook. And I've had to get to a point where I now have started blocking people on my Facebook page because um, it's one thing to disagree with the scripture. I have no problem with people not understanding the scripture. But when they start not, not only disagreeing with the scripture, persecuting me, saying I'm teaching something false without backing it up with scripture, and then posting false scriptures and false doctrine on the on the on the uh, <laughs> Facebook page, um, God told me that's not acceptable now. And so, because of what He's trying to do around the world, so it's been a hard time because I've I've had to block a lot of people that I've talked to for a long time because of their attitude has dramatically changed towards me. But the goal is to bind on earth, and we're going to be talking about that. So I just want to show you a little bit about our ministry. This is Wilfred. Uh, Wilfred is from Kenya. And um, this is his picture. And uh, Wilfred, the young guy, uh, excited. I met Wilfred a while ago, and uh, you know he has a ministry out there. And this was his baptism. It was really um, interesting because um, I had shared with Wilfred, and I started asking him some basic questions about his conversion. And he had talked about praying Jesus in his heart, and he had accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I said, okay, are you open to learning a little bit about some different things because the Lord's been showing us about some different scriptures? And he said, yes. And so I started teaching him about baptism and, and what it meant. And he said, well, shoot, I need to be, re I need to be baptized because I haven't had my sins forgiven. And, you know, like for us, if I wanted to get baptized, I could literally go upstairs to the pool, I mean, to the bathtub, or I could go around the corner to the pool or find a body of water somewhere. But this gentleman couldn't find a body of water. There wasn't anything near him. So he had to go for miles to go find a place to get baptized. He took one guy with him and said, I'm going to do it. And he went and got baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. And he came back rejoicing and he started sharing with his ministry. And so here's some of his ministry. Uh, he has a lot of kids in his ministry that they teach God's word to. Um, and then also, you know, some of the parents, they're all together over there. And, you know, this is where they live. This is their housing area. You know, it's not the best, cleanest place in the world, but they do what they can do. And they have an online donation program that they, they raised a little bit of money because Wilfred's son was in the hospital also. And thank God um, he was able to raise enough money to get him out of the hospital and pay for the medicine, which was um, because he had pneumonia and he also had malaria. Um, his little baby son, he sent me pictures the other day. And so I just want to thank you for the prayers and the people that, you know, decided to, to give for that as well. It's been really encouraging because... They teach a lot of these kids um, God's word. And this is just some of the pictures. There's a lot more as well. But I just want you to keep them in your heart because they're disciples and they're making disciples. And Wilfred has another story, which I'll tell you in a little bit. But um, some of the parents, they have around 20-something parents in there and adults. And he's been studying with them. And he's now starting to baptize the parents because they didn't understand baptism for forgiveness of sin. And you just watch what that's going to do. It's going to explode here soon because of, you know, God's spirit will go forth. And then there's another gentleman named Chris. Chris is from Uganda. And um, this is Chris uh, out there. And again, this is the areas where he lives. 
And, um, you know, this is something that we did for him. Uh, he needed a computer, by the way, with Wilfred, he got a computer as well. We got him a computer and a projector. The reason why is because they teach God's word and they project it, they want to project it to a group of people. And he was just telling me yesterday that um, they're setting up an auditorium for 100 people to start teaching this God's word and they need speakers. So I'm working on um, having a garage sale this weekend so I can try to generate a little extra income for them so they can actually get the speakers so they can broadcast this out to over 100 people um, and, and that will come into this message and learn uh, the teachings of God. And they're not now starting to teach what we teach, just so you understand. They're not just teaching something else. They've taken our videos, and they've got the computer now. They've learned about the Sabbath day. They've learned about the commandments. They've learned about the baptism. And not only have they learned it, they are now teaching it. There's a difference. There's one thing to learn it. But it's a whole other courageous and bold thing to actually take what you've learned and actually teach it to someone else. And they've only been with our ministry less than a month. And they're already teaching it. Because that's the heart of God that these guys have. And this is another gentleman, John. I'm really excited about John because John is amazing. I call him John. I don't know how to actually pronounce his first name. It's Agabai or something like that. But John, we love you, man. And John is amazing. I mean, he said, bro, you don't even have to warn me about the Sabbath day. I'm going to be there. And he has some brothers and he said he's going to be on the computer with him. Uh, we actually got him a computer too. But something else that got John asked me to do for him uh, which I didn't understand. He, he wanted, um, there's a TV station out there called DRTV. It's kind of like our cable. And what John wanted to do is he said, if you get on the DRTV, we can broadcast your message all throughout, throughout Nigeria. And I said, okay, well, what do we need to do for that? And he told me how much it cost, and it was a bit of money that I didn't have, but I said, I'll find it. And so I, you know, shared it with some of you guys, and some of you donated for that. And then I also got some money from some other things that I had to sell, and and we sent it to them. And now that DRTV is going out this Monday to all of Nigeria. And it was last week's message about uh, the Great Commission, about how to become a disciple, how to get baptized for the forgiveness of their sin, and how to obey the commandments, which is what we taught just last week. And so John is now sending that message out. And he's been studying the Bible with some of the guys out there. And they're fired up. He also, we also bought DVDs for him. He said, Stephen, if you give me some DVDs, I'll pass these DVDs out. And I said, okay. So we had put about four or five messages on these DVDs. He made 5,000 DVDs. And he stood on the street corner and passed those DVDs out one at a time by himself. He has no ministry. He had nobody around him. But now he does have people around him. Now he is starting stu um, studying the Bible with people. This man is fired up for the Lord. He calls me every day. Not almost every day. Every day. Two, three, four times a day because we're his lifeline. We're the people that we have. He has nothing but dirt and stuff around him and clutter and mess. And then he has us. And he's fired up for it. And so John is out there studying the Bible with people all the time. And he said, I will help advance the kingdom of God. And this man knows the scriptures. He'll quote me scriptures left and right about different things. And I'm fired up about John. And so I hope you guys are encouraged because, you know, God's been doing a lot through your, this little ministry. We're small. We're tiny. We don't have much money. We don't have much of anything. We have no power. Kind of like the, the, the church of Philadelphia, it says in the Bible. We don't have anything. But you know what we do have? We have the Holy Spirit. We have faith. Uh, we have a, a deep conviction to be here every Sabbath day to commune with the Lord. And the Lord's going to do some amazing things, things through this ministry. And you watch. He's going to do amazing things to your life as well. Another thing we did with John is John didn't have a place to live. He was living with a friend. And we went and got him a place to live. We, we, I didn't realize for a little money, for $200, he could actually get a, a house for an entire year. For 200 bucks. So we got him money and, and now he has a place to live. And he needed a mosquito net because I didn't know what the heck a mosquito net was, but a mosquito net is a plastic net that goes over um, the bed so that mosquitoes don't eat him alive all night long. Because the first day he actually um, was in the hospital, one of the first days he was in the hospital after getting the place because he, you know, was infested with mosquitoes. So we had to get him a mosquito net too. Um, so this is what we got to deal with, but I just want to show you guys something, something real quick. I want to show you something real quick, just really briefly. Um, this is a video. I'm not going to show the whole video because we have children in the house. But I do want to show two minutes of the video or 30 seconds of the video. 
Not, not a long time, but there's a reason why. And I'll, I'll explain in a second. This is um, Wilfred and his ministry. Something devastating happened the other day. So I just want to show you the cruelty of people. Of what's going on in our ministry right now. These are people. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going any further. This is a five minute video. And this was the most cruel, inhumane thing I've ever witnessed with my own eyes. And it, it messed me up to the point where I came home yesterday distraught in my heart. And I took it out of my family. So I just want to first of all apologize to all of you yesterday for you know blowing up at dinner and not being um, as loving and as kind, as gentle as I could have been. And so I'm sorry because after seeing this, you guys, you don't know, understand, it messed me up inside because there was nothing I could do about it, and I wanted to. And to see these people, these are disciples in our ministry, in Wilfred's ministry, that were ready to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. And these men decided in that town that they don't have enough food to eat. So to, to help deal with the food issue that they don't have, they decided that they're gonna kill off the old people. And they all were, had weapons, and they had surrounded them. That's why there was a lot of people around, but no one did anything. Because they were armed. They had guns. And they were armed so that the people couldn't stop them from doing it. And what you didn't see here, what you're not seeing in this video, is that they beat these people with sticks. And they beat them down into a, into a hole in the ground. Into a little cavern in the ground. And they beat them to the point where they were laying down. They threw sticks over them and they burned them alive. That's what they just did on this video. And Wilfred must have taken this picture with his camera because he sent me the whole five minute video. And I just want you guys to know this is what's going on in, your, in the world with your brothers and sisters because we are in the end times. And this is just what we see. Can you imagine what we don't see? If this is what we see, if this is what they're boldly doing just because they're hungry, you can't imagine what's happening in Brazil and in Argentina and in Puerto Rico, and stuff that's going to happen over in Hawaii and in other countries around the world. It's scary, you guys. And this is the time we live in today. This is 2018. This is not years ago. This is right now. So God wanted me to just share that with you just so you can understand why this is the time that we need to have the keys of the kingdom and, and help teach this message around the world. If you guys want that video, you'll be able to see it online later. But I just wanted to share that with you because the Lord told me people need to have this in their heart. They need to be um, convicted about this message, about what's going on. And if this is challenging for you to see, good. It should be. Because we have it easy over here in the United States. We, we may have suffered. We're all suffering in different ways. I've suffered in my health. My wife has. All of us have suffered in different ways. But our suffering is nothing in compared to what other people are suffering. Because not only did Wilfred see this witness it personally to his people he's been preaching to, the rest of the day he was joyful. The rest of the day he went and preached the message. The rest of the day he was talking to me on Facebook and getting together with pastors and, and talking about the situation because they're scared. But they're still teaching the message. They're still preaching the word of God. They didn't stop and say, oh, I can't do anything now because of that. No, you know what he did? They went and preached the word. They were bold and courageous, like that song said. So today we're going to go through a message today that God put up my heart, which is the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Can I pass this over, please? So we're going to go through this message today. So let's look at some scriptures. We're going to start at Matthew 5. I'm sorry, Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Actually, Matthew 19. And we're going to start in verse 16. Matthew 19, start in verse 16. Actually, I get it backwards. It's actually... Matthew 16. I wrote it backwards on the paper. It's Matthew 16, verse 19. Matthew 
Matthew 16, verse 19. We're going to start in verse 17. It says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he orders his disciples to not tell anyone he was the Messiah. So, there's a couple of things that God wanted me to put here. And, and on, your, on your little notepad there, it's, or your paper, and, and you want to write this down if you don't have the scriptures handy. But it says here that he was telling Peter that on this rock, which he is the rock, so on himself, he was going to build his church. The church is built on Jesus Christ. And so it says here, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So if you look at what it says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. So we would all want to know the key to the kingdom of heaven. And so look what it tells us what the keys to the kingdom of heaven is. It says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So on the paper, God inspired me to, to write down whatever it says here. This is a blank line there. If you notice, it says, whatever I. So what God wants you to do right now is fill out the rest of that sentence. Because when he was telling Peter this, he would start talking to Peter. But right now, when he came in Matthew 28, he told everyone to go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey the commandments. So if you look at what this says here, it says, whatever I, what would be the rest of that sentence? Bind on earth, but we bound in heaven. That's right. Whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever I lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we got to ask ourselves the question, what is the only thing that we can bind on her earth and take to heaven? The only thing we can do are two things. Number one, we can bind ourselves on earth and make it to the kingdom of heaven. That's number one. The other thing we can bind on earth and take to heaven is other people. So you want to write that on the paper. So what we can bind ourselves on earth and take it to heaven, we can bind other people on earth and take it to heaven. And that's it. Not our cars, not our money, not our career, not our soccer career, not our college education, not our, our friends, not our family, nothing, nothing, our friends and family, if they're obedient to the scriptures. But there's nothing else we can take to heaven but ourselves and other people with us. So we got to start asking ourselves, how many people are we attempting to take right now? How many people do we have a heart right now that we're trying to bind on earth so we can bind them in heaven? So we're going to talk about what it means to bind someone on earth, to bind. What does that actually mean to bind? I know if I got a, a, a string right now, a rope, and I wanted to bind something together, I would tie it real tight, right? I would tie it tight enough so it doesn't come loose, right? So I would tie it not so tight that, like in basketball, my son plays basketball, he goes, he has to double knot his, his shoes, right? He, why does he double knot them? So that in the game, while he's playing the game, they don't come loose and the shoes fall off. That would be embarrassing in the middle of a basketball game. Shoe fly off. Right? So you want to double it. You want to bind it tight. So in the same way, that's an attitude that we need to have towards ourselves and towards other people. So we're going to look and see what the Bible says of what it means to bind and how we bind ourselves. So let's go at 1 Timothy. First Timothy. Four. First Timothy four, we're going to start in verse one. First Timothy four, verse one. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in the later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaming, 
Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience are seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry in order to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. So that's one important thing to understand is that there's some people that are deceiving people by teaching of false teachings and false doctrines out there. And it says in the later times, which is right now. So we got to be aware of one of the things that we got to do for ourselves and purify ourselves is we got to be aware of these false teachers. And that's the reason why on Facebook, as now, which I didn't do before, um, when people start doubting the scriptures, I don't mind us going back and forth having a dialect because it's an understanding issue. But when people start to <coughs> accuse me of teaching false doctrine without backing it up with any scripture, and then wanting to post their own false doctrine on the, on the site, they're done now. I have to now block them. Not because I'm mad at them, because I have to watch myself from that. Because God tells me that that's going to happen. i got to you know, protect the, the body of Christ because of that. And the people that really want to know the truth. And here's why. Because look what it says here. Yeah, it says, they, let, let's keep reading. Let's just keep reading verse 6. It says, if you point out these things, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Nourishing on the truth of the faith and of the good teaching you have followed. That's why I'm sharing this message with you. Because I want to be considered a good teacher and minister of Christ as well. So I'm sharing this message with you because the Bible told me to. Another thing it says here in verse 7, it says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. This is another reason why I don't have those conversations any longer. Because it says to not have anything to do with godless myths myths. And that's exactly what people are doing. I show them techniques and show them things about the Bible, about how the Sabbath day works, and then they want to throw up their own wives' tales and myths that they've learned from their pastors or from the Jews or from someone else, and I, and I try to show it to them, and they won't understand any logical thing that makes sense. They want to come up with their own opinions and ideas, so it says have nothing to do with them. And you need to learn to not have anything to do with those two. You want to give people time to repent. You want to give them the opportunity. If they're open to learning, that's one thing. But if they start doubting what you're teaching, then the Bible says have nothing to do with it. Look what it says. Verse 8. For physical training has some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saving, saying and deserves full acceptance. This is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. Look what it says next. Command and teach these things. What does it tell us to do? Command, Command and teach these things. And it's not just talking to the pastor. It's talking to all of us to learn and teach these things. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So what does that mean for you that are young here in the room? That we can still, like, don't let people look down on you. That's right. Don't let anybody look down on you. You still have the ability. If you pay attention, take notes, and really understand what's going on, you can share part of this message. The Bible says don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. Especially if you've been baptized for the, with the Holy Spirit, you're in the same realm as an adult. You can be tried as an adult. Hope you guys get that. If you're young and you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, you're tried as an adult now in court. Just like if you commit a crime and you commit an adult crime, you get adult penalty. You understand? Very important to understand that. So it says, don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. Just because you've been in the faith for a short period of time. That has nothing to do with it. Verse 13, it says, until I come, 
devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. So what did the Bible just tell us we need to commit ourselves to and devote ourselves to? Public reading of scriptures. Public reading of the scriptures. To preaching and to teaching. Now, public doesn't mean you have to go out on the street corner and do that. Because I'm publicly doing it all the time on Facebook. Almost every night I'm studying the Bible song. Almost every day I'm studying the Bible song. When I'm in my at the gym, I'm studying the Bible song. I'm always publicly teaching this message. Not just to you on the Sabbath day. Oh, we talk about it on the Sabbath day. That's what I'm sharing with you. But when I'm not on the Sabbath day, that's when the, it's time to go. It's time to go to work. But here's the question you got to ask yourself. How much time and devotion are you spending publicly reading scripture and preaching and teaching? How much time are you doing? You need to ask yourself that question. Matter of fact, why don't you do this right now so that you can be clear for yourself, so that we don't deceive ourselves. Write on your paper from 1 to 10. 1 means uh, from 0 to 10. 0 means you never do it. And 10 means I do it on a daily basis. So get your piece of paper out and write down a 0 to 10 of how often you do this what the Bible tells us to do. Devote yourself to public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching others. Not just reading it for yourself in a quiet time. So write that, do that for yourself. So you can see where you are. This message is for the brothers and the, and the, and the sisters in the body. But look what it says. Verse 14. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. See, this is a gift that we've been given, you guys. God has given us this gift of knowledge and wisdom of the scriptures. And the covenant and the keys to the kingdom. He's given us this gift. The Bible says don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. And so it's very important that we have that. That's one of the things that we can do to bind ourselves on earth. And look at what it says next. Let's look at the next scripture there. It says, verse 15. It says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone will see your progress. And here's the next part to it of how we can bind ourselves in heaven. It says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So there's two parts to that. One is you got to watch your life closely. So how you live, when you're in, in private or in public, and like I said years ago, I learned this sentence. It says, how you are when you're alone is who you really are. So who you are when you're by yourself around no one else, when you're up in your room by yourself or doing whatever you're doing, who you are alone is who you really are. It doesn't matter who you are outside because God sees you anyway. So it's very important to understand is you got to watch your life and how you live if you want to make it to the kingdom of heaven. The second thing it says you got to watch is your doctrine, what you know and what you teach. That's why I record all these videos. I record these because I want to be held accountable. And I, I, give this, I give the opportunity to anyone, if I'm teaching something inaccurate in Scripture, come and show it to me. I'm more than open to repent. But you got to ask yourself right now, are you watching your life and your doctrine closely? I teach so many ministers, and it's so encouraging because all these people overseas that I'm teaching. Here in the United States, I'm sorry, it's unfortunate that 99% of them know everything. Now, there's some that don't, that's come aboard with us recently. But it's amazing how many people, they just know everything. They just know the scriptures so well. Now, they don't teach anything on video. They don't actually have any scriptural, biblical principles. They just know everything in their head. And they, their theories and concepts and ideas, they think they got it all together. But you can't be like that. It says you got to watch your life and your doctrine closely. Because if you persevere in them, both of them together, then you'll save yourself and your hearers. So this is one of the ways we can bind ourselves on earth. And, and watch our life and doctrine closely. So let's look at another part of our doctrine real quick. We're going to go at Matthew 28. And this is a basic scripture that we all teach as disciples. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So one of the ways we have to make sure that we can bind ourselves is we have to become a disciple first. And then we have to make disciples next. That is the job of a disciple. See, that song, I Give Myself Away, is so exciting and so prevalent because the question you have to ask yourself is, are you really giving yourself away? Or is your life and your future, your dreams and your hopes and everything else, is that your aspiration? Or is it making it to the kingdom of heaven and helping others make it to the kingdom of heaven? What do you think about all day? Because the Bible says whatever your heart is at, that's where your treasure is. Where's your heart? Is your heart focused on this world, your future, your, your job, your career, your family in the future, your, your school, your, next, you know, your profession when you get older? Is that your heart? Is that where your heart is? Or is your heart in the kingdom of heaven? Now, we definitely have to have a balance. We have to have balance. We've got to be able to have balance because we're here on earth right now. But we've got to have our focus on heaven. See, we're strangers and aliens on this planet. But so the first thing we got to do is ask yourself is, are you really a disciple? Are you really acting as a disciple? Or you just have the disciple title? Because that's one thing that we got to do if we want to bind ourselves to heaven is we got to be a disciple of Jesus. It says, then it says, <coughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's the next thing we got to make sure we've done is that we've been baptized. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But we got to watch our life and doctrine closely, and then we got to teach them to obey the commandments, which we're going to look at here in a little bit. So that's the first thing. So this is more of one of those teachings like we talked about last week. So you can take these scriptures and be able to teach them to others. These are the things that I've been sharing with people. So let's look at a couple of scriptures on that, about being a disciple. What actually a disciple is, my kids love the scripture because I say it all the time, but it's so important because it's what a disciple is. John 8, starting in verse 31 and 32. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciple. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So a real true disciple of Jesus holds to Jesus' teaching. This is something that we stress all the time because I talk to so many people. And they want to teach me that a day starts at night. Now, the Bible clearly says a day starts in the morning. But because they've been branded and taught that a day starts at night by the Jews, they're not following God's teaching. They're not following what they've been taught. If they just read the scriptures, they know that a day starts when the morning starts. If you ask any three-year-old child, when does a day start? Every one of them will say when the sun comes up. If you ask them, when does the night start? They'll say, when the sun goes down. I mean, it's not like uh, uh, creative or revolutionary. That's like pretty simple. But see, these wise people think they know so much that they think a day starts when the night starts, when it gets dark, which makes no sense. But that's just because they're not, they're not Jesus' disciples a lot of the time. They've been deceived, and they won't even look at the scriptures to see what the Bible says. So you got to understand, as you're studying the Bible people and talking to them, you got to understand what a disciple is. A disciple holds to Jesus' teaching. Not to their own teaching, not to their pastor's teaching, not to their fair family and friends' teaching. It holds to his teaching, and there's only one place you can find his teaching, and it's in the Bible. So that's the first thing a disciple does. It says, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so that's the next thing we're going to look at is what does it mean to be set free? Let's keep reading what it says here. John 8, first starting in verse 33, it says, They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we've been set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now the slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. So here's the question we got to ask ourselves. How does the Son, which is a capital S, we know that's talking about Jesus, how does Jesus set us free from sin? See, because you have to become a disciple first, and then you'll learn the truth. And so what is that truth that sets us free from sin? 
This is the deception. So if Jesus is telling us this, that means there's deception out there about this particular topic. And it's one of the biggest ones. Last night I was at a minister last night I met um, on, on Facebook again. He leads a church in, um, I think it's another part of Africa. I can't remember the, the, the part of it. But we are talking about it. We had to go through two hours of studying the Bible on this one point. Because I asked him, well, how did you get your sins forgiven and how did you receive the Holy Spirit? And his answer was, well, you know, I, I, I went and I said the prayer. I said a, a prayer and I accepted Jesus in my heart as my Lord and Savior. And, you know, I confessed with my mouth and I really believed that Jesus was Lord. And then I acted on my faith. I said, okay, so, you, so let me just make sure I'm clear. You believed you received the Holy Spirit when you said a prayer and you um, asked Jesus in your heart, right? He said, right. I said, okay, do you mind if I show you something in Scripture that might contradict that? So, oh, yeah, absolutely. I said, okay, well, let me just tell you in advance that this is probably going to challenge your belief. Because based on what you just said is different than what the Scripture says. And he said, okay. So I showed him Acts 2.38. I showed him the Scripture. And then all of a sudden he said, oh, yeah, and I was baptized. And I, I said, I understand. But when I asked you how you got your sins forgiven, you said you did it at a prayer. And now all of a sudden he wants to ramp it up and say, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. When I was baptized, that's when I believed I got my sins forgiven. I said, I know. But when I asked you the question, you said you, you believed it at a prayer and you got baptized a couple months later. And so we go for two hours worth of this. And at that point, his mind was already convinced that that's what he believed when he got baptized. But biblically speaking, I think he might be an heir. I think he believed, just like he said he did, that he received the Holy Spirit out of prayer and when he confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart. And then when he saw the scriptures about baptism, then he believed about baptism. So what does that tell you? That he was deceived in his knowledge. In other words, his doctrine was off. And so even though I started showing him the true doctrine, all of a sudden he now had to go. It was, it was time for him to go. And I, and I understand, it may have been late. But that's okay, because he's still open to studying the scriptures. So now he has to determine whether if he was actually baptized for the forgiveness of the sin, or was his doctrine off. And so I had to be the man to be able to share that with him in love. Because I care. But the question is, are you willing to wrestle with people to that extent? And this was from 2 in the morning till 4 in the morning, is when I was doing that last night. And I've been doing this almost every single day at different times of the day because this is when people need to hear the message. And when I find someone open, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help them hear the truth. So here's the question. you got to be able to teach this to others. you got to be able to teach baptism for forgiveness of sin. So look at So you got to ask yourself, for one, have you really had your sins forgiven? Do you really have the Holy Spirit? And are you really part of the one body of Christ? you got to really ask that question. Not just think it, but be able to verify it with the scriptures. Let's look at a couple of scriptures on that for you, for your edification, so you can know what scriptures to show. Let's go to John 3. John 3, starting in verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we want you to know you are a teacher who have come from God. We know you, no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus replied, or Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Okay, so here's another thing that you want to show people and show yourself is that you must be born again. It doesn't say should or it's a good idea. It's a must. So unless you want to make it to the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. It's, a, it's not an option. And so we're going to look at what born again means. Because a lot of people are deceived on that scripture too, but we're not going into the deceit today. Even though some people will say, well, the water it's talking about is the water of childbirth, and then baptism is baptism with the Holy Spirit. 
which doesn't make sense because every human being on the planet was born of water of childbirth. So Jesus didn't mean that. And, but Jesus is going to explain exactly what he means when you look at Matthew. Matthew 3. Matthew 3, starting in verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, who I love. With him I am well pleased. So the big thing I want you to see here as you're studying this message out and helping bind people on, heaven, on earth is that the Holy Spirit comes down on the exact time they come out of the water. There is no time delay. You don't get baptized today and receive the Holy Spirit six months later. Or you don't say a prayer or receive the Holy Spirit from some <laughs> sinner's prayer and then go get dunked later in water for baptism. That doesn't make sense. See, Jesus gave us the perfect example right here of what his baptism is. So it's very important that you understand how to explain this to people as you're trying to bind them on earth. This is one of the things that binds them on earth is their baptism. Now, I'm going to show you why. Jesus did a demonstration for us so we can have something to look at. So now we don't need to have any misunderstanding. Two things happened here. One, he was baptized in water. He wasn't baptized just by the Holy Spirit. He was baptized by the Holy Spirit in water. And then when he arose, the Holy Spirit came on him. That's a proof right here in Scripture. So as you're studying this, this message out with people, you can convey that message to them so they can get it. Mm -hmm. But let's look at a couple other things, because a lot of people don't really understand the purpose of baptism. So let's look at Romans 6. Romans 6, starting in verse 1, you got to understand what baptism means. What's the meaning of baptism? Because people will say, well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, the thief on the cross didn't need to be baptized at that time because they were still under the law. Jesus had not died, buried, and was resurrected yet. His death, burial, and resurrection was his baptism that we participate in now. And you're going to see that in Scripture. Verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. See, your old life is on the cross just like Jesus' life was on the cross. Then he was buried and died was buried on the, in, in the tomb. We are buried in baptism in the water. And then we raise to a new life that's called born again. So I know it may seem simple to some of you, but you know what? For the majority, it's not simple. For the majority of the people out there have no idea what baptism means. That's the reason the thief on the cross wasn't baptized because Jesus had not died, was buried, and resurrected yet. So he was still under the law at that point, and at that point, Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do while he was alive. But this is something very important to share with these people about how to help them be bound on earth. So let's look at another understanding of reason for baptism, which you've all gone through before. This message is for you to be able to teach this to others. Acts 2, 36. Actually, we're going to start in verse 36. Yeah, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? That's who we should be looking for, you guys. That's the people we should be looking for. The ones that say, 
I want to know the truth. What should we do? Tell me more. That's what I'm looking for. Not the ones that say, oh, I know everything. I think I got it all. Let me teach you how this works. Now, if someone has something they want to teach, absolutely be open to listen. But if, they're, if they don't, if you ask them a couple questions like, so how did you get your sins forgiven? How did you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? And how, tell me how that happened. And it doesn't line up with the Bible teaches, then your, your job is to instruct, teach, and preach this message to them. Look what it says in verse 38. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, is for your children, and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So this is a very important point of understanding what baptism is. It says, first of all, you have to repent and decide to turn from your sins. So like right now, I have a guy that I met in, in Africa again, another guy that just all of a sudden came to us. We studied the Bible the other day. We went through who Jesus was. He already knew that. He said, no one's ever taught me the scripture like this. I showed him what baptism is. I showed him how it works. So we went through the discipleship. We went through all the studies. He said, I need to get baptized for the forgiveness of my sin. Unfortunately, there was no water where he lives. Could you imagine living in a place where there's no water? No water, no standing body of water anywhere, and they have no bathtub. So he said, wow, um, I don't know what to do. I said, pray about it. God will make a way. So he went and told his sister what he wanted to do, and his sister said, well, I have a friend. We can go over there and get baptized. So perfectly by today, we'll have another brother in the, in the faith that went to get his sins forgiven. And got baptized for the forgiveness of his son. But this is, this is a message that people want to hear, you guys. People want to hear, but we got to be willing to open our mouth and do a study with someone. It's not just being a disciple. It's go be, make a disciple, baptize them, and teach them to obey the commandments. And so this is very important for people to understand that baptism is for the forgiveness of their sins. And then it says, so they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift comes immediately. It doesn't come after a week. It doesn't come after God, you know, finishes doing something else. No, they get out of the water and the Holy Spirit comes on them right then. And it's by their faith that they are saved. That's how it works. So we have to be able to share this message. And look what it says in verse 41. It says, those that accepted the message were baptized. And so if someone's not going to accept this message, then they should not be baptized. They have to be willing to accept this message. Not just the message of the cross, not just the message of Jesus died for our sins. They got to be willing to accept this message. Because those are the only ones that Peter baptized, and those are the only ones I'm willing to baptize. And this is the mindset that you want to have as you're out studying the Bible people. So let's talk about one last part about baptism real quick. It's what um, baptism represents. So let's look at 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 18. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put into death by the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not from the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. So this is where another one of those deceptions get kind of squashed because people think that baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. And, but what the Bible says in verse 20, it says that baptism now saves you. 
See, the baptism is what saves us from our sin. See, our sins are washed away just like the flood of Noah washed all the sin away that was on the earth. You understand? That's how it works. Just like when the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, the, the water came and washed away all the sin of the Egyptians, and they were freed on the other side. That was their baptism. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians. So it's very important to understand that the water symbolizes baptism of the flood. The water, baptism isn't a symbol, it's the water of the flood, which is the symbol. And so it's very important that you convey this message with people because people are deceived out there. So God wanted you to understand how to articulate the message to other people. So baptism is part of what saves us from our sin. And that's why, if you notice here, we can have a good, clear conscience towards God. Because now all of our past sins are gone. And now we can strain towards the future. So now the next part is, in Matthew 28, he says, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So what did he command them? Obey the commandments. And let's look at that. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 5. Now the reason why we're reading this we read it again last week, I think, because it's very important. The Bible tells us to read it all the time. So let's look at it again. Deuteronomy 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear Israel, the decrees and laws I declared in your hearing today, learn them and be sure to follow them. What does it say to do? <coughs> learn them. And just hold them in your heart and do nothing with them, right? No, be sure to follow them. So this is the thing that God wants us to understand is that we want to make sure that we individually are honoring these commandments. Let's look at what it says. The Lord our God has made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made the covenant, but with us. With all of us that are living, alive here today. And I'm going to say the same exact thing right now. The Lord has brought back his covenant to us. Because if you look at the scriptures, God divorced Israel and took away his covenant. He got rid of his Sabbath days and his holy days and his new moon festivals and his feasts. He got rid of his yearly festivals. He got rid of them because we were disobedient. But he also promised that in the last days he's going to bring them back under covenant. So this message right here is directly to you, the body of Christ. All of us sitting here that are alive here today. We got to understand that this message is for us personally. Look what it says. Verse 4. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire in the mountain. And at that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord. Because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up out of the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of this land of slavery. So who is the Lord our God today? Jesus. So Jesus is our, the Lord our God, and he brought us out of Egypt, which is bondage, out of our land of slavery. How did Jesus bring us out of slavery? Through baptism. Through baptism. We just looked at that. See, we were a slave to our sin. And in the same way he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, with his mighty hand, is the same way he brought us out of our sin with his mighty hand, through baptism. Look what it says. You shall have no other gods before me. So that's one thing we've got to make sure, that we don't have other gods before us. So what types of things can be a god? Something you put before Jesus. Something you put before Jesus' message, which is go preach the gospel. Go teach the message. It's something that's more important to you than that, that could be a god to you. So you need to look at your life. This is for you to reflect on this message. You need to be looking directly at your life and say, let's look at the last six months. Let's look at the last 90 days. Let's look at the last four you know, year and a half. What's been most important in my life? How much time do I think about the purpose of God that I died to myself, that I've given myself away to others to really help bind people on earth? Because we can bind ourselves on earth, 
We know how to do that. But how, many, how much effort, how much mindset, how much heart, how much desire, how many goals, how many plans do I have to go bind someone else on earth, on heaven, on earth, so that I can take them to heaven? This is a gold book I have. This is the gold book. This is something I bought a while ago. I just opened it up to this page. I didn't even know what was going to be there. Right here, it says 7,000 remnant search on my goal sheet. And it talks about a plan. I've written out a plan of how to find God's remnant of 7,000 disciples that the Bible says that are gonna, that's going to be there in the last days in the book of Romans. 7,000. I have a plan to do it. That's why I'm willing to spend my cryptocurrency to get this message out of Nigeria. That's why every day I'm sitting here talking to people online. That's why every day I'm sitting in these videos and posting them on Facebook and getting them out and teaching this message as often as possible because it's a plan. It's a goal for the Lord. It's something that I'm doing for him. I've died to myself because I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt in my opinion, now I'll say my opinion, but I believe that he's coming this feast of trumpets. All of the signs are there. He's told us this year. He's given us all the covenants. He's put us back on his calendar. He's bringing the flock. He's bringing the people. I believe he's coming. Here's the question. Do you? Do you really believe he's coming? Do you really believe Jesus is coming this year? Here's how you'll know. Actions speak louder than words. Because if you really believe he's coming, ask yourself, are you putting in the heart to even have the idea or even inclination to bind someone on, on heaven? Because what does Jesus want? He wants people in heaven. He wants to fill up his wedding banquet. He wants the people that want to know the truth to be there. Yeah, are you even, uh, even in your in your Intellect, even in your thought process throughout the day, that that's a desire of yours to help someone new you don't know today. Someone you don't know today become a disciple tomorrow and get their sins forgiven. Is that even in your psyche? Is it even in your daily agenda? If not, then you need to look and see as other things become your God. Because you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and that's your plan, that's your mission as a disciple. Everything else is extra. Everything else is extra. Let's keep looking. That's just the first commandment. Let's look at the next one. You shall not make for yourself an idol, an image in the form of anything in heaven, above and on the earth beneath and the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So we got to make sure that we don't have something else as an idol. We don't have something else as an image or a graven image of, of the Lord. We've got to make sure that we're not doing that. We love him by obeying his commandments. Look at the third one. Verse 11. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For no one will, for the Lord will hold no one guiltless who misuses his name. Now, misusing his name could mean teaching false doctrine. That's why I'm so careful of the things I'm sharing before I share it. That's why in these Bible studies, all I'm doing is reading the scriptures. I'm not coming over my own theories and ideas and concepts. I'm reading the scriptures and we're talking about that. I don't want to be accused of misusing the Lord's name by teaching false doctrine. But you've got to be willing to share that with others and let them know that too. Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So the way we observe the Sabbath day is by keeping the day holy. That means stop doing some of the things that you normally do on a regular day. There's things that you do on a regular day. But today is the day you keep holy. That's why after this message, what I usually do is I'll, I'll edit the video. I'll somehow get it up on Facebook and YouTube so I can get it ready to sit down. I'll study the Bible with someone tonight. I'll do my best. I'll spend time with the family and go out and hang out and, and keep that day holy with the family. I'll play with the kids and go to the park. and I try to do different things than I normally do on a regular day to keep this day holy. Holy is different for every person, of course. But you need to ask yourself, are you really keeping this day holy? And if not, you need to be... We repent and start keeping the day holy. But another thing is you need to be teaching this to other people. Because there's so many people that don't keep the Lord's day holy. And it's very important. Look at the next one. Honor your father and mother. 
as the Lord God commanded you, so that you may live a long, long in the land. That, I'm sorry, so that you may live long, and that it may go well for you in the land the Lord your God has given you. This is to the kids, and it's to the parents, it's to us as well. But you need to honor your father and mother. So guess what? One of the ways you can honor your father and mother by respecting them, by being obedient to them on the first time, not the second, third, fourth, yell, fifth time. But on the first time, when you know, by by actually you know being there and being present at what is being taught to you, by having a heart to serve your parents. So it's very important that you honor your father and mother. Another one is do not murder. Well, in the, in the Bible, in Matthew, the Bible says even being angry with your brother or sister is considered murder. So do you have anger in your heart? If that's the case, then you need to repent. You need to get that out. It says, do not commit adultery. In the Bible, we know there's a couple of different types of adultery, but one of them is a spiritual adultery, meaning um, you're teaching false doctrine or you're holding on to false doctrine. You're learning things that are not true and you're holding on to those. So we need to teach people what adultery means in Scripture. It's an adulterous generation because this generation is steeped in false doctrine. There's 42,000 different denominations. 42,000 different denominations. I could hear maybe three. I mean, this one Muslim type of Muslim. This is one Buddhist. I don't know 42,000 different types of Buddhists. You understand? There's one. <laughs> but the 42,000 different denominations of quote unquote Christianity. That's deception, you guys. We need to be teaching this message. So we need to be teaching people not to commit spiritual adultery. So you should not steal. So you shouldn't steal. It says you should not give false testimony against your neighbor. You should not cover your neighbor's wife. You should not set your desires on your neighbor's house or land or male or female servant or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I want to stick on this one for a second because do not covet. Remember the rich young ruler when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to get eternal life? The very first thing Jesus said to him is, no one is good. That's the first thing he said. And then he said, keep the commandments. That was the very first thing he said to the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler had a very simple question. What must I do to get eternal life? That should be a question for you. And that should be a question you need to be asking people. What must you do to get eternal life? What do you believe it takes to get eternal life? The number one thing Jesus told him was that you need to keep the commandments. That's Matthew 19, verse 16. Keep the commandments. But the guy said something very humbly. He said, I've done all these things, but what do I lack? That was his question. Which one does he lack? And the one he lacked was the one Jesus is talking about here in verse 21. It says, you should not covet. In other words, he loved money. He loved money. Money was his, his God. And that was probably one of the idols as well. You know, his money was his desire. But look what it says here. You should not set your desire on your neighbor's house, male, female service. Guess what else you shouldn't set your mind on? What everyone else has. Being like the Joneses. Setting your heart on things of this world. Setting your heart on what everyone else is doing or whatever else has or, or is getting. We're going. That's not what we need to set our hearts, especially if we believe Jesus is coming on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, it could be this feast. It could be next feast. But all the signs are pointing to this feast. I'm putting my money on this feast, just like I did every year. But you know what? Every year, he gives us more signs to look at. And this year, there's been the most signs by far of any time. So if you believe that, you don't want to be coveting anything in this world. The Bible says someone who loves the world is a, has hatred towards God. So it's very important that you know you bind yourself on earth, but you need to be teaching this message to others so that you can bind them on earth and get them focused in the right direction. Their focus is off. Why do you think Satan made all these video games and made these TV shows and made all these sports and made all this stuff? Why do you think he did that? So we're not focused on the Lord. That's why he did it. 
So our focus is not on him. That's why he gave you a, a, a big screen on your cell phone and a big screen TVs. And he gave us all this fun stuff and amusement parks and par things to go play and friends and play dates. He gave us all this stuff so you won't focus on the Lord. And he's done a darn good job of it too. Because most are not focused on the Lord throughout their day. Matter of fact, they almost don't focus on the Lord unless they read their Bible for a minute or three and then they come to the Sabbath day. Or they go to church. Or they go to the synagogue. Or whatever it is that they consider themselves doing. See, most are not focused on the Lord. And they definitely aren't focused on His purpose. And His purpose right now is to bind on earth and bind in heaven. And the only way that's going to happen is through disciples of Jesus that know the truth. And we're the disciples of Jesus that know the truth. So this is very important. So now that we've read, you know, all these commandments, look what it says, verse 22, it says, These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to the whole assembly there on the mountain and from out of the fire and the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more, and he wrote those, them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. Of course, we know when Jesus came and sent the Holy Spirit and came down on Pentecost, he put the Ten Commandments on our heart. We know that. We know he put the Ten Commandments in our heart. And so, in the same way, he's given it to us again. But now let's look over at Deuteronomy 6 real fast. Deuteronomy 6. And again, these are messages that you've heard, but you need to teach them because the Bible tells us we need to talk about them all the time. Not just every once in a while. Especially as the day approaches, we need to be talking about it all the time. Look at what it says, verse 6-1. It says, these are the commandments, commands, decrees, the laws the Lord God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing to the Jordan to possess. So you've got to understand, the reason why he's commanding us to keep teaching this over and over and over, because obviously we haven't got it yet. So he's teaching us to observe, to, to do these, and, and to do these things and, and to learn this message. Because we're about to go into the promised land. Just like the Israelites were going to go into the promised land. Look what it says. And it says, verse 2, So that you and your children and the children after, me, after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees, commandments that I give you, and that you may enjoy long life. That's why he's giving it to you. He wants you to have a fear of the Lord. He hopes that video scared you a little. If not, maybe you need to watch the whole thing. Maybe you really don't have a fear of the Lord and you really need to watch the entire thing. See, see, video games have got us so distracted and so messed up. You know what? My 10-year-old son wants to watch the video of people getting killed. See how, see how messed up um, video games have done? Because he's so used to playing video games that of killing people or seeing people die in real life isn't even that bad. Isn't it amazing how that is? It's not even that detrimental to an 11-year-old child. It's just that's what video games do to us. It, it desensitizes us. That's what TV does to us. That's what all this worldly stuff does. It desensitizes us to where my 11-year-old son would raise his hand excited to watch people get killed on a video. That's sad. It's really sad. And, and it's my fault. I'll take responsibility for even allowing that to happen. I take, my, I take responsibility. But that's, it's going to adjust. It's going to change. It's going to change because it's my fault. But you've got to understand here. Look at this. Verse 3. Hear, Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hand and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. So that's the reason why we're talking about this today, you guys, is because... You know, we need to 
really be talking about this all the time. We need to be teaching these commandments to our kids all the time. We need to be purifying our kids all the time and ourselves because we're headed to the promised land. We're headed to the kingdom of God. We know this is the time. All the signs are there, you guys. The Lord's commanded me to prepare you the way, prepare the way for you. Prepare the way, and we've done that. The scriptures have shown you what it takes to make it to the kingdom of God. And I'm doing everything I can to bind on earth so that we can be bound in heaven together. But you have to do something for yourself. If you're engulfed in stuff that's not going to help you make it to the kingdom of health, the Bible says cut it off. Cut it off. If, if there's something that's causing you to sin, the Bible says cut it off. It's better to go into heaven with one eye than it is to go with two eyes and be thrown into hell. That's what the Bible says. It says if something's causing you to sin and your hand causes you to sin, it's better to chop that hand off than it is to go into hell with two hands. Jesus is not playing when he says this, you guys. He means it. Because he wants you to make it to the kingdom of heaven. Because in the kingdom of heaven, you get new arms and new eyes anyway. You get a new body. So why does it matter if you only have one hand here? But that's a heart that he's looking for. If, so, if there's a video game that's causing you to sin and, not, and be so desensitized, then what does the Bible say? Cut it off. If your cell phone's causing you to sin, because that's all you do is stare at it all day long and all night long. You can't let it be within two feet of you. If that's the case, then guess what? The Bible says cut it off. If something's causing you to sin, and it doesn't matter what it is, it tells you to cut it off if that's what it's going to take. Because we have to purify ourselves to be the bride. And so the Lord wanted me to share that with you because you got to ask yourself, are you really keeping the Ten Commandments? Or do you just know about them? Do you have them memorized? Are you really keeping them? Because if not, you need to repent. And this is the time to repent. And this is for you. This is for my family. And I, I, I'm here. This is all of our family. But this is the message that needs to be taught to the world. They need to repent. So let's keep going about how we bind others. How do we bind others? Just a few scriptures left on that. So we now know how to bind ourselves. 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. Starting in verse 8. This is how we bind others. Look what it says. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insults with insults. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to you, you were called. Because to this, you were called. So that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Wow. So one of the ways that we help people is we have this heart toward people. And we got to let them know that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. We know that the definition of righteousness is obedience to the commandments. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 24. So we know that God's eyes are on us and he hears our prayers. We see the people getting healed in our ministry. We see the prayers of the righteous. We see challenges too. Satan's on the, on, the, on the path as well. But see, we're still faithful. We're still here. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And we got to let them know that too. Look what it says in verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? 
But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, because in your heart revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. See, the hope that we have about the Feast of Trumpets, that's our hope, that we're going to make it to the Kingdom of God on the Feast of Trumpets. And I believe it's this year. And if anybody asks me, I can give them 15 reasons why I believe it's this year. Can you? Do you have that knowledge? It's on the videos. Have you watched any of my videos again in the last six months? Any of them? Have you just taken the time to go on YouTube to watch one of the videos so you can really learn it? Because, yeah, you may have heard it on the Sabbath, but do you know it? Have you learned it? Do you, do you have the heart to really want to learn it so you can teach it? Because the Bible tells us to be prepared with an answer of why you have this hope. Why we know the bride's coming. Why the Feast of Trumpets. Why that's the day. Why this year the day? Why do we believe we're at 6,000 years? Do you know the answer to that question? Because the Bible's given to you. We've shown it. We've shown it on video. So do you know the answer? Because the Bible told us that we need to be prepared to give an answer. And look what it says. But do it this with great gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is goodwill to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So you know, he didn't say we're not going to suffer. He just said if we're doing good, it's a blessing to suffer. I saw a brother yesterday on Facebook, he had this t-shirt that said something about you need Jesus. And he lives in a Muslim country in Africa. And he had this big bright red shirt on with white letters that said, um, you need Jesus. Now, in his city, they kill each other. The Muslims kill Christians. But he's bold enough to wear a red shirt and he has that shirt on and out in the public teaching people that they need the Lord. And you know what he said in his Facebook message? He said, I'd rather die doing good than to sit back and do nothing. Do you guys have that heart? Are you really acting as a disciple? Do you really have the heart for the people that are lost? You gotta check yourself. You gotta really ask yourself that question. Because that's what I'm asking myself all the time. And it's a balance, trust me, to be able to work and, and pay the bills and run, lead this group and lead my family and go to the soccer practice and be a dad and be a husband. It's, it's a balance, it's tough. But it's doable. People are doing it with much worse circumstances than we have. Much worse. If you're living in the, in the United States and you have nothing, you are a hundred times better off than the people in other countries. And you got to see that. You should be ashamed of yourself if you're not doing something for the Lord and dying to yourself. Let's keep looking. So that's one of the ways that we can help bind others. Here's a couple other ways we can help bind others. Second Timothy. <coughs> Second Timothy four. Second Timothy four, starting verse one. It says, In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So that's the first thing he tells us to do. Is that we need to preach the word. And he's not talking to just the men. He's talking to the men, women, and children. To the level that you have an understanding. You have more knowledge about the kingdom of God than virtually everybody on the planet. You have more knowledge about the kingdom of God. So you have to have that heart to be willing to preach the word. And be prepared in season and out of season. 
He tells you to do several things. One, correct people. If they're incorrect in their teaching, you need to correct them. You've got to ask them, are you open to learning something different? That's a great question. You may want to write that down. Ask the question, are you open? Don't ask if they're interested. Ask if they're open. Ask, are you open to learning something different about that, that teaching? When the people say, yes, they're open, then I share it with them. So you need to correct people. It says rebuke people. These are people on Facebook, I have to rebuke them because they're teaching false doctrine. And after I rebuke them, sometimes I have to delete them and block them so they can't teach false doctrine to anybody else. You know, they say, Steve, you're so arrogant. I'm not being arrogant. I'm just reading the scripture. I post scriptures on the Facebook. They want to argue the scripture. I show another scripture. They want to argue the scripture. They want to say, I'm teaching false doctrine when I'm posting scripture. I say, you know what? No problem. You have a blessed day. And I'm done. I don't get mad at them. I say, I have a blessed day. And I thank them for being there. And I pray for them. And that's it. It has nothing to do with being arrogant. It has to do with what the Bible tells me to do. It says encourage. I encourage people. There's people over in different countries. I'm encouraging them. I'm encouraging them that the Lord has not forgot you. The Lord hasn't forgot them. Yes, they may be going through some challenges. But I can guarantee you, the Lord has not forgot the poor. The Lord has not forgot the people that are suffering. The Lord has not forgot these people over there. He's coming for you. Have you told anybody that? Have you shared with anybody, any friend or family, that the Lord wants you to know the truth? That the Lord cares for you? That the Lord wants you to know what it takes to make it to the kingdom of God? You've got to be able to encourage people also. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. And that's what we need to do. Because we are in that time right now when people are not looking for sound doctrine. They're not keeping sound doctrine. They don't even want to put up with it. I put a basic, simple scripture out there about the Sabbath day. They tell you how crazy it is for us to count to seven after we see a new moon. That's crazy. But, the, but this one guy tells me the moon was created on the fourth day. Well, well, what did we do for the first three days? There's no sun and moon? The first three days is so stupid. It makes no sense. So sound doctrine is not even there. Common sense is not common in 2018 right now for parents to let their kids decide what gender they want to be in. See, common sense doesn't exist anymore. There's no more common sense. It's uncommon to have common sense. So th this is happening right now. You gotta understand this. But for us, we have to keep our heads in all situations. We gotta endure hardship when we're preaching the word. We got to do the work of an evangelist. If you notice, it doesn't say become an evangelist. It didn't say that, did it? What did it say to do? Do the work of an evangelist. Meaning you're not an evangelist. You know what you are? You're a high school student. You're a mother. You're a parent. You're a sister. You're a senior. You're a, dis you're a disciple of Jesus. You've made a commitment to die to yourself. You're a disciple of Jesus. And he tells you to do the work of an evangelist. In other words, go preach this word to the people that need to hear it and that want to hear it. And God has now given us the tools to be able to touch all four corners of the world. It's called Facebook. There's two billion people on it. Search for someone that's looking for the word of God and go talk to them. They give you the free ability to speak to them. They allow you to message them and talk to them about the word of God. That's what an evangelist does. They go evangelize the world. And this needs to be our heart because we have the truth. We've been given the keys to the kingdom. We've been given the knowledge of the truth. If we don't teach it, who's going to? 
There's many churches out there, many pastors going to Africa, going to South America, going to different places around the world, teaching false doctrine, and they're teaching it with zeal. They're excited to go preach uh, the sinner's prayer. Or say, um, just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're saved. Oh, they're fired up. They'll go die to themselves to teach that. But us that have the knowledge of the truth, that have the eternal protection, that have God's spirit in us, that have God around us, that we have the power that can move mountains, but we won't go talk to somebody because we don't feel comfortable doing it. We should be ashamed of ourselves. We are the movement. We are the church of Philadelphia that God has given us this information to be able to teach the world. And he's given us the tools. We are without an excuse. Without excuse. Let's look and see who we should be talking to. Matthew. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, starting in verse 1. Now Jesus saw the crowd. He went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are those people? Where, where do they live? Where are the people that are poor in spirit? Do you think, do you think Wilford right now and all the, the brothers and sisters, 20 or 30 brothers and sisters out there, they just saw somebody's parent just get burned to death in front of them? Do you think, do you think they're poor in spirit right now? What do you think? you think they're hurting? They're not sitting in a nice comfy living room and running near a house, you know, on a Sabbath day, enjoying a beautiful sunshine. They're looking for something to eat right now. That's what they're doing. They're trying to find a way to, to have some food today. They're poor in spirit, but look what the Bible says. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, blessed are those who mourn. Do you think they're mourning right now? What do you think? you think they're mourning the people that they just saw and killed? I think they are, because I'm mourning them. I've never seen anything so horrific in my life. Well, except for all the movies where I was desensitized for it too. But I'm not desensitized anymore. It says they will be comforted. And I pray that, you know, Wilfred's taking this message and John and those guys and, uh, and other people that we'll be able to share this message with and um, we can comfort them with the knowledge of the truth and give them hope that Jesus have not forgot about them. Because he hasn't. It says, blessed are the meek, will they inherit the earth? The humble, the meek. You should see all these people just sit over there in the middle of the dirt doing absolutely nothing all day. But they still love Jesus. They have not denied his name. Kind of like it says in the church of Philadelphia. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. And this is who we should be looking for on Facebook by asking a question. Are you open to learning something about the new Sabbath day? It's not Saturday or Sunday. Are you open to learning about it? Because there's a lot of people out there that are hungry and thirsting for righteousness. I met another brother on Facebook from my old church. Now, nobody in the church, none of the leaders want to hear the message. But I met one brother, and we talked, and I asked him, are you open to learning? And he said, yes. We spent four hours studying the Bible yesterday. The, the day before yesterday and we went through the Sabbath day and he said he was going to be on here today and I don't know if he is but because I know it's like midnight out there or something but he was fired up he said I will honor the Sabbath starting from this point on and I am going to teach to my family and he's in my old church and I pray that that little seed can spread throughout the ministry in Nigeria or wherever he is out there because there are people that are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Because he said, man, no wonder why I, know something, I knew something was dead in our church. I couldn't put my finger on it. Yes, because they knew him elementary teaching. He was a baby, an infant spiritually. Because he didn't know anything about the mark of the beast or revelation or any of these things. 
but you do. My 11-year-old son knows more than most of those people in that church. You understand? So there are people that are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. But we got to be there to open our mouths to hear it and to do something about it. It said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see God. All those children over there, that's why it's so encouraging to know that children under the age are going to see God. Even though they're going through the most horrific lifestyle they, that we can even imagine. And that's the only thing that allows me to, to, to get through the day sometimes. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We haven't been persecuted over here. Not yet. We haven't s sacrificed like people have sacrificed around this world for the kingdom of God. We live in Goshen. We've been protected like nobody's business. What I don't want is us to deceive ourselves thinking because we've been protected, we can do nothing. We still have to die to ourselves and give ourselves away. And we still got to let our light shine. Look what it says, blessed are you when people also insult you, pursue you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled underfoot. So this is something we got to realize is that if we don't let our salt be salty, the Bible says we're good for nothing. So this is talking to you personally. You got to ask yourself, how salty have you been? See, if we want our eggs to have salt on them, we have to pick up the shaker and do the salt, shaking. The salt doesn't just jump all the salt on the eggs. We actually have to do something. So in the same way, if we want to be salty, we have to do something with our salt, which is go and salt in the earth. Verse 14 it says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So that's what we need to be. We need to let our light shine. This is how we bind others to the kingdom of God. You know, when I was giving this money away to these people over there, I didn't know them. I had just barely met them. You know, I've been hit up online for so much money for so many years, and I never gave a penny. But God told me, no, trust them. They're my people. Give it to them. And I said, okay, amen, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And I said, God, I'm giving it to you. If they choose to do something wrong with it, that's on them. That's between them and you. But they did something great with it. You know, and this is a mindset that we have to have is we got to let our light shine. How shiny and bright is your light right now? Have you been allowing your light to shine? If not, then you need to repent. It's time to repent now. Jesus is coming and it could be this feast of trumpets. Now is the time to let our light shine. Okay. It's two last scriptures. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, starting in verse 12. Actually, that wasn't the scripture I was looking for. It's actually Acts 2.31. Excellent. Go to Acts. Uh, Acts 2.
Go to Acts 2, starting in verse 42. See, if we have this heart and we let our light shine, and we, you know, have the heart that we're going to bind on earth, or we bind in heaven, we bind ourselves on earth, and we bind, you know, the people we meet, uh, this is what it can look like, and this is what it can look like, and, and this is what God's going to do. It says, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I want you to understand, I'm not an apostle. I, don't, I didn't walk with Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. So I would just say they devoted themselves to the disciples' teaching. And not just to my teaching, but to your teaching as you're a disciple. And you start bringing people into your home. You should be having fellowship in your house. Start bringing people to your home. And bring them to the Sabbath day, and then have three, four, five people here watching this message. Start having fellowship. And then you can start making disciples in your area. It says they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It says everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. That's another attitude that we have to have. That's why I'm having a garage sale this weekend. I told my family we're cleaning this house up. Anything that's extra, I don't care what it is. If it's a band-aid, if someone wants to buy it, they can buy it. We're getting rid of all this junk. And I've invited others to donate stuff, friends and people that are starting to give us some things that we can sell in our garage sale. Because this money is going for the need. And whatever that need is, that's what the money's going for. It says here, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And that's what's happening with our ministry right now. And, you know, I've been pouring my heart out to as many as possible. But God wants now you to, to take part in that and do the work as an evangelist. The way the body of Christ will move across this world and find those 7,000 remnant that he says. And he'll prepare the way for the angels to come down to teach the people uh, when the bride is gone, is we have to prepare the way. Just like John prepared the way for Jesus, it's now our time to prepare the way for the people that want to know the truth and make it to the kingdom of God. Let's end it off in prayer. Father God, I just want to come to you today and thank you so much for this message. Thank you for preaching through me to teach this message about, you know, helping bind ourselves on earth, Father, and helping bind you know, others so we can all make it to the heaven, to the kingdom of heaven, when you come on the Feast of Trumpets. Father, I just want to pray that everyone here uh, was encouraged by this message. I pray they were challenged by this message. I pray they were inspired by this message. And I pray they, they, they learn something that they can do, they can repent. Father, I pray that everybody here will set goals, very specific and deliberate goals, with intent to achieve them, to help as many people as possible make it to the kingdom of God. Father, I pray they look at their list of friends, and they look at list of families, and they give them one more opportunity, one more shot, to hit them right between the eyes and be bold and direct with love, to be, encourage them to look at the scriptures, Father. I pray for the people that are lost, the people that are out there, that don't know Jesus, that, that want to know. I pray. Some of them can come as well. But Father, I pray for the lost sheep of Israel. God, the, the lost sheep that you told us to go find in the, in the book of Matthew, Father. You told us to go to the lost sheep and find them, Father. So I pray that all these people in different countries around the world, where you've scattered your people all around this world, God, can start to find us. Can find individually one of us and, and we can share that message and invite them to the Sabbath day. And, if we have to send them a computer, then that's what we need to do. If we need to help them in any way to be able to get to this message before September 11th on the Feast of Trumpets this year. Father, I pray you, you bring your flock. Father, I pray you give us the strength to endure whatever hardship we have to go through. God, and most importantly, I pray that you help us stay unified in teaching this message. We thank you for all you do for us. We love you. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.